Hi, readers. This is Kari. This week, Alexis and I are proud to give you a special episode heard only by a select group of test listeners in 2019. When the show's over, please head over to Apple Podcasts and let us know what you thought. Without further ado, enjoy the show. When was the last time you picked up a dictionary? A what? Oh. Did you use dictionary.com instead? You know it. Was you talking during my part? <laughs> Go! <laughs> When was the last time you picked up a dictionary? Did you use dictionary.com instead? Let's take a witty and in-depth look into the obsessive world of lexicographers with the help of an editor from the oldest dictionary maker in America, Merriam-Webster. The editor is Corey Stamper. The book is Word by Word, and you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get get lit! readers this is alexis and this is Kari, and you're listening to lit society yeah. a show about books and a little bit about drama mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how you doing Kari? i'm good okay. i'm good all right so, how was your week it was great i spent <laughs> most of it reading this book which broke my brain and also made me think i don't english <laughs> but I don't English. Um, I can commiserate with you. You can what? <laughs> <laughs> Just say agree. Don't don't do this. Let me I tell can't you. Take anymore. Go, please. Um. So I'm. Go- How are you now? You just got in town. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> I didn't just get in town. Oh. I have actually been in town, but I did step out of town yeah. for a moment this yeah, week. Yeah, you were. I went to a in conference. one of my favorite states mm-hmm. in New York. Yes, love it. Yes, I went to this steakhouse. It was really good. Now, now, did you go into a steakhouse by yourself? Yes, I did. And sit down and have an adult meal. Yes, I did. Look at you. You're growing up. I hadn't done that in so long. Oh, isn't it nice? I felt proud. And you just look at people like, ooh, they about to break up. And then you just get your <laughs> second glass of wine. I just look at them. You know what? Actually, it was a night of events. So there was a big event in this room, a big event in that room. A did you crash any here. of them? No, I did not. You had to crash something one day. I had to focus on reading my book. Oh, you were at the <laughs> table eating steak reading this book? Yes, I yes I did. It's heavy. Yes, I did. And in fact, let me one. just admit that I finished reading this book about an hour ago. Oh, but you finished is the key word. Hello, I always finish my book. I finished at 2 a.m. last night. So <laughs> I was trying to finish, but at one o'clock I had to give up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me Your stop. brain said, okay, that's enough of that. That's right. And turned I had off the to lights. Quit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's mm-hmm. how it be sometimes. I do. Don't be checking my English. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's called African American vernacular English. Hey, and you use it if you want all the time. Mm-hmm. Roll with the e-bomb all the time. That's T A H M time. However, however you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but let's jump into this theme of the week. Okay, cool. yeah. Each week we select a theme to discuss, inspired by the book we're reading. So I felt like it made sense to choose language and culture, thinking it was going to be easy, but <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Not easy at all. What I learned, of course, is that language is created within cultures. Yeah. Um, each culture has their own traditions and lifestyles and subcultures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then within that, you have ethnic groups and then um, geographical locations mm-hmm. and then social status that uh, have their own languages. For sure. And then there's this standard American English that is actually a dialect. Yeah. So language English. is like a big Broadway show. Everyone around the world may know Hamilton. But do you know the off, off, off Broadway show? Hello. Which is also a thing. Yeah. Get yeah. into the details. I don't know what I'm saying. But it's a real thing. Yeah. Even within that. So like one of those off, off, off ones. Yeah. Dialect. It's a field of study. Mm, so in field mm-hmm. of study, there's there's this their own unique language, unique language. Mm-hmm. Technology has its own unique language. I write for a brand. I actually wrote a mini dictionary. Hey. And so when it was time to read this book, I thought, oh, I, I do what she does. No. <laughs> so what I wrote was essentially an ad <laughs> for a luxury company. And they had their own language, but it was one page. OK, but. 
It's a thing. This is, yeah. It's a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I came across a PBS documentary. Now, I did not have time to read it because I was still reading the book. So I didn't have Mm -hmm. time to watch it. Um, It was back in 2005, and it was called Do You Speak American? Mm Mm-hmm. Have you heard of it? I think so. I I think I'll go back and watch that because I'd be interested to hear what it says. Because in the trailer, it had um, Steve Harvey in there and he was talking about how he didn't understand. <sighs> he never used, isn't, it, uh, regularly uses ain't. Oh, okay. And then there's, um, then they had other people s- south, you know, the do northeast. Do you use isn't? Sometimes. When do you say isn't? Well, I mean, give you, one example. You can't just throw that on just, me. Which is, if you use it, when do you use it? That isn't the appropriate use of that word. Also at work is when you use it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you have to say. Not, that's not true. Girl, switch I, them codes. Go ahead. I use it regularly. Mm. I'm not going to continue with that line of thought. I but. ain't never heard you use it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ain't I that do. something? <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> I also, but anyway, I think I'm going to go back and watch that because I think it would be interesting. And then I came across this website that kind of furthered the thought of language and culture being intertwined. Mm -hmm. And it said it's called daytranslation.com. And it says you cannot understand one's culture without accessing its language directly. And part of accessing the language is learning about the specific societal customs and behaviors. So that made me think of you. Mm -hmm. You know a language. You know Italian. Oh, <laughs> why you lie to people? Oh, no, I mean I used to. Okay, you I don't used think you to. can say you know a language you don't speak it on a regular basis. Well, okay, at one point you spoke um, Italian. Do you feel like at you, a fifth grade level? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Did do you feel like you could have learned the language without learning about the culture, the customs, and the behaviors? Um, mm, could I have learned Italian without knowing about the Italian culture? Yes, for sure, because I needed to focus on learning the way Italian is spoken in America, where people speak, they speak different variations of Italian into one condensed form for getting by on a daily basis while speaking to other Italians from different areas of Italy. Does that make sense? So to me, I already was not learning about the culture. Now, when I went to Italy, it, it was a different Italian. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's like, <clears throat> it's like uh, you think you know English and then you go to maybe like the Crescent. Boston. Or Boston, yeah. And you don't know their English. Right. You so, don't know that dialect of yeah. English. And then I was learning um, Italian for a purpose. Mm-hmm. And within that purpose, within that uh, field of work, was its own, like you said, language specific to that work. Yeah. So a conversational Italian, I didn't know very well, and it's still hard for me to um, understand Italian spoken in like a movie, unless it's a kid's movie. Oh, really? That I'm familiar with. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. So, uh, so, so culture to me, to answer your question is, I did learn Italian without knowing the traditional Italian culture well. I knew the culture that's Italian American. Okay, so but then when you were in Italy for a time, mm-hmm. did it help you? Oh, for sure. Being yeah, in the being immersed oh, yeah. in the culture. Oh, for sure, absolutely. That's like the best and most accelerated way to learn a language is to immerse yourself. I agree. Okay, yeah. Well, good. So then, to a point, in that article. But I don't think that's because of the culture. I think that's out of necessity because everyone else is speaking. This tongue, you have to learn it to get by on a daily basis. And part of learning that, though, is learning is learning the culture, though, because you have to learn how people use words, use the words. Uh, So for that theory to work, I think it has to work and vice versa. So there are Francophiles who are obsessed with Paris and, you know, everything about France. My husband is one of them. Yeah. So <laughs> I love Paris. How could you be so? Oh. No, it's great. It's cool. Okay. Um, wow. bon. But <laughs> that doesn't mean that by learning the culture, you become an expert on the language and you can excel in one without knowing anything about the other. I, I do think so. Because a lot of people take English, for example, we don't even understand why we say a lot of the things we do. So you might learn our culture and it doesn't give you a window into why we speak English the way we do. And actually, I understand that 
so if you call maybe an organization that uses an out of country call center and they're not connecting the words that you Oh using. my goodness, so that, Sprint. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Okay. All right. You, sure. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. Oh, it got it personal. Just, it did. But that is <laughs> that is a thing. And then they're reading from a script and you're like, no. The, so if, they're if not I'm speaking to you in my professional version of English, how are you communicating with someone that does not know the specific form of English. Yeah. So then I yeah, think good point. it is important, yeah. even though you can do it, you're probably more successful if, if you, you know the culture. If you know the culture. Yep, you're right. If you know the culture. So just to round this out, what I learned from this um, little research is that, and this is actually a quote in the book, that language is deeply personal. It's the way that we describe who we are, what the world around us is delineates what we think is good from what we think is bad. Mm. So, yeah, that's a thing. Let's hop out. No, it's something I wanted to tell Uh-oh. you. Uh-oh. Which so, one? So, I was watching a show about the Unabomber. Mm-hmm. And it dropped this gem on me that I would also like to uh, co-drop on you. Oh, boy. You know the saying, you can't have your cake and eat it, too? Very familiar with it. Has that ever made sense to you? No, because I like cake and I like to eat it. Too. And if you have it, you can eat it. Mm-hmm. Well, apparently that was not the original form of this idiom. What? You, I'm going to blow your head open. What? I don't like the sound of that. I'm sorry. Can you I'm reel that back a little bit? English. Um, the original form was you can't eat your cake and have it too. Now, doesn't that make sense? Because if you eat your cake, you don't have it. That's and now so I'm getting the moral of the story, which is you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both That's ways. That's all it is. Ooh. So, what did you learn, sis? Yeah, so thanks, Unabomber. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, wait. How does that relate it to It was in his Unab- manifesto. I'm so sorry. I'm going to cut this part out probably. But the point is, the idiom makes more sense in its original form. So what made you look that up? I'm so, so sorry. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> don't All laugh. right. I'm sorry. And with that, we'll yeah, move let's, on. Let's, move let's on. take a quick break. Okay, great. And we're back. Yay. Kari. Uh-huh. Are you ready to give us some no. background about the author? Okay, great. Okay, so Corey Stamper is a lexicographer and former associate editor for the Merriam-Webster Family of Dictionaries. She grew up in Colorado, attended Smith College, and studied Latin, Greek, Norse, Old English, and Middle English. So she really loves languages. She does. She's got a YouTube series for Merriam-Webster called Ask the Editor. And she also provides uh, lexicographical and language-related commentary for various media outlets, including mm. the Chicago Tribune. I thought hey. that was cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. Did you know anything about Corey that you can share with us? Please edify me. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> they talk. A, she talks a lot about her life in the actual book. She for sure, She includes yeah. portions of that. And one of the things I learned is that just at an early age, she was a voracious reader. So <laughs> can I use that? Sure. All right. Cool. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that she this love of language started early on. Yeah. And she has an anecdote about that a little bit. But um, I also learned that she is writing another book. Now, I think that was as of December 2018. So she may still be in progress. Okay. So I don't know the name of the book. But there was an article that I read that said there's a section of this book that would have been called or a chapter from this book that Mm -hmm. would have been called Word of the Year that is supposed to be the start of the next book. I'm so happy she she took a chapter away from this book (laughs) and saved me another four hours. Yeah, to say the least. (laughs) So great. Thanks for that context. Yeah. Why don't you give us a brief synopsis? Word up. That sounded so, so clever in my brain. Hmm. Listen, Alexis, words have meaning, and behind every great definition is a pale, emaciated lexicographer melting away under the fire of language. (laughs) What does take mean in to take a nap? And how is that take different from take in taken aback or 
take a meeting or take a poop <laughs> with sharp wit and a terrifyingly large <laughs> vocabulary. Corey Stamper busts wide open the complex, obsessive world of lexicography. The most seemingly boring profession in the world is painted like a new branch of the Marvel universe. Thanks to Stamper's <laughs> keen knack for honest storytelling and her passion for logophilia. In the end, three things are clear. One, our language is constantly changing. Two, the people who define it are insane. And three, no matter how hollowed you consider its pages, the dictionary ain't no holy book. <laughs> And if this book doesn't break your brain, it will make you a better writer and speaker of the English language. Mm, I like that. Thank you. I like that. So what were your first thoughts of Word by Word? So, you know, I don't particularly review books before I read them. Yeah. Um, or kind of check out what other people say. So I didn't have anything. I was excited. You're not big on reviews. So mm -hmm. you don't really care what other people think. You like to form your own thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to jump in this fresh. And so I was excited diving in. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think of a person sitting behind a desk writing? I did not. That never <laughs> came to me ever. No. Because it sounds so painful and sad and torturous. <laughs> the way it's described in here, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. It's an acquired taste, that yeah. profession. Did you did you have first thoughts about it? So I thought this book was going to be about... So I love language. I do. And I love words. And I feel so grateful to have been taught English from childhood because I don't think it's a language I could have learned in my adult life Wow! because it has so many exceptions yep. mm -hmm. and you know so many words are borrowed from other languages yep. so I was really ready to just or I thought I was ready to just <laughs> dive into this this you know I, I'm a writer I write you are and you write well thanks boy was I humble thank you for that synopsis it was lovely oh, and detailed thanks. As I said, you're a great writer. Oh, you love me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares what you think? Nothing but lies. <laughs> well, then let's just jump into the book then. Okay, cool. All right, go. I'm so scared right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I know why, it's so I'm so glad so it's your worthy. book. <laughs> let us begin our deep dive into Word by Word. Part one. Sprockja fools. <laughs> Oh, you dare start with that <laughs> word? Okay. So, I'm not going to really go in order. There are some themes in this book that I yep. think we'd have fun discussing. Mm -hmm. I know we'd have fun discussing. Readers, don't turn off this show. It's going to get really great. <laughs> yeah, it is. In like two seconds. So, Corey learned, as you said, that she loved language early on. Mm -hmm. And she began collecting words like people collect friends. She meets a new word, learns what it means, and um, gets to really know the word, its origins, its historical uses. And uh, she then pulls from it with ease as her vocabulary continues to grow, like a head cheerleader pulling dates on a Friday night. Okay, then, cheerleader. She begins working uh, for a company that's been around longer than 33 of the 50 nifty United States. <laughs> That's crazy. This company is very old. Yeah. It's the Merriam Webster uh, company that creates dictionaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, um, she describes the headquarters for us. Yeah. Now, how would you imagine the headquarters of Merriam Webster to be? I mean, I would. And please keep in mind, you live in Chicago, so you know what the headquarters of McDonald's looks like. <laughs> so I, what would you think Miriam Webster would look like? I mean, I would think it would be filled with books, you know? I mean, grand like, though, right? Like yeah, Harold like, Washington. Huge library of mm -hmm. books that they could refer to. That's what gold to me, gold staircases. It smells like a library. Absolutely. I mean, there are people just reading everywhere. Moments. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so that course. ain't it. <laughs> She says, however, that it's straight from a David Lynch dream. Do you know who David Lynch is? I don't know is? who David Lynch yes, is. Yes, you do. You ever seen Elephant Man? <laughs> he directed that movie. Oh. So the point is, it's dark and it's yeah. creepy type of building. Forgotten with time. And that makes sense because times, they are a changing. And I can't imagine the dictionary is making a whole lot of money. No. But it's kind of a necessary institution. I agree. 
The quote I'd like to bring up here. Now, we are going to forsake some dramatic readings this week, but we do have some things from the book that we like to quote word for word, mostly um, because our vocabulary does not reach the heights of Corey's. (laughs) Not at all. She says, as she begins her job at Merriam-Webster, that the vast majority of people give no thought to the dictionary they use. That's true. Mm-hmm. Um, it merely is like the universe. To one group of people, the dictionary was handed to humanity, ex chele, a hollowed leather clad tome of truth and wisdom, as infallible as God. To another group of people, the dictionary is a thing you picked up in the bargain bin, paperback, on sale for a dollar because you felt that an adult should own a dictionary. Neither group realizes that their dictionary is a human document constantly being compiled, proofread and updated by actual living, awkward people. (laughs) Her words. They were. They were. (laughs) I love this because, nope, I don't think about people when I think of the dictionary. No, you don't. don't. Why don't we? Because it's because we have computers and we type in a word yeah, and the even, word pops up with a definition. Even in your youth. You're right. <laughs> in real life. Yeah, you're right. But I never thought about somebody in the room. Silence. <laughs> and it takes them years to write a dictionary yeah. to, to revise it. When the third edition comes out, the fourth edition, the fifth. 10 over 10 years has passed in between that time. And I got to say, when I was in fourth grade, I had a teacher and her punishment was for us to write the dictionary. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that punishment. How uncreative. (laughs) But (sighs) they should make people read this book. Mm, I'll be good. Mm. (laughs) Okay, Get started. Pick a letter. So in her journey, she learns a few indisputable facts. First, English is far from pure. It's a mix of German, French and Latin mostly. And it's spread in the beginning almost too quickly to regulate. To be a lexicographer, you must possess this Sprachgefühl, which is one of the German words English is stolen. And it means like a feeling for a language, just this natural feeling. It's why. Unless you are a native speaker of English, you likely cannot be a lexicographer because you just have to have that hunch in the back of your head that something about a specific definition has to be refined, even if it's something you can't explain. Yeah. And I don't know if you go into this and you're just um, a little but What did you have? Yeah, I was going to talk about how um, early on this standard English actually came from these uh this upper class that mm-hmm. felt like it was being tainted but i don't i can't remember the line of work can't. These, oh go ahead yeah this the line of work the people um were coming in they were now making a lot of money and they were they're the new money people that were coming in and they wanted to make them so specifically um colonizers started making a lot of money when they uh went into their different merchant professions maybe merchants. fishmonger merchants And these were people from the lowest class of society that had all this money. And all of a sudden they were rubbing elbows with the upper class. So they needed to sound like upper classmen themselves and they needed a book to tell them how to do that. Yep. She does say, though, however, that if you don't have this certain something, this Sprachter fool, it'll become very apparent within six months. And that's okay. Don't be disappointed. That means that you can leave for a more lucrative job like takeout delivery driver. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the point is, that. they don't make a lot of money. Uh-huh. They do it because they love the language. <laughs> also, a dictionary is out of date the minute that it's done. Yeah. So imagine working on something for five or six years. You finally publish it and it's already time to re- rewrite it. Um, everyone thinks words fall into one of our four parts of speech. And we're taught Honey. that, you know, noun, verb, adjective and adverb. Nope. That's just what they tell you in school, because the truth would make your brain explode like Pompeii in 79 AD. <laughs> Words oozing down your forehead until you're mummified in a cocoon of determiners, prepositions and interjections. I'm, you know what? I was like, what is parts of speech? I don't know nothing no more. All right. <laughs> yep. That is how I felt mm-hmm. reading this book. It was too Same. much. It mm-hmm. was absolutely too much. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But maybe you love this idea. And if you do, you're a logophile, which is almost worse than a pedophile, but (laughs) more socially accepted. Dictionaries don't shape language. It's the other way around. Language shapes dictionaries. You mad about a word in a dictionary? Be mad at your neighbor for using that word. 
Can you make more noise? I'm so, I'm so sorry. I really loved learning this part. Me too. I, I did. Um, I appreciate it a lot learning that it's the word usage. That, that determines if it's in the dictionary. Yeah. Because I did kind of look at the dictionary as the authority. Who didn't? Yeah. Who didn't? Don't and use a word if it's not in the dictionary. Right. Because the dictionary tells us what words we can use. Right. Nope. Yeah. And that's not true. It's so great to learn that. Mm -hmm. Quote, all a word needs to merit entry into the most professionally written dictionaries is widespread and sustained use in written English prose. That's how ain't and irregardless got in there. Give me your top three words that you hate when people say them. I don't know that I have that. I, I don't, know you do. I don't consider myself like a language. OK, fine. Whatever. Word thingy so. Person. So, no, I don't have it. So if you're not a language word thingy person, you may still hate the word irregardless. However, she comments. She, she too did. hates it. However, it made the dictionary mm -hmm. and it dates back to the 1800s. Yep. So it did not come from Mean Girls. Also, <laughs> <laughs> there are words that are just as bad that we have no problem with. Unravel. What does unravel mean? <laughs> if something is raveling, it is coming apart. What is unravel? What is unthaw? <laughs> I love Are that. you thawing it or are you <sighs> unthawing it? That's the same. Thaw. Inflammable. Okay, she got a lot of them. So she, she made her point. Yeah, she so made it I think it you well. are high and mighty. Mm-hmm. Use she a lot of words well. that don't make no sense. Yeah. But that's the thing. But in that chapter where she talked about irregardless, I really liked it. That one I feel like resonated with me most because it, it talked about um Ebonics and the African American vernacular mm -hmm. English, which she said editors don't they use that instead of Ebonics. She called it like a dog whistle, right? Yep. Ebonics is a patronizing name for the way black people speak. And mm -hmm. all the black people I know have always looked at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it is a joke of a word. But then it's also not um, that goes into that culture. Your oh, it's culture? just the title I have a problem with. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I remember when that was a thing. Yeah, it was, was a huge political there. movement. It was. And, and nobody wanted it to be called that. No, mm -hmm. it was a cart that people were using to hitch on their political train trying to you know, become something that they weren't. Yeah. And so, I can think of a few people specifically. And yeah. So now they want you to aspire, aspire to this um, elevated form of speaking, if mm -hmm, you will, mm -hmm. that was created by um, the nobles, mm -hmm. the white nobles. That don't exist. Right. The nobles that died hundreds of years ago. Right. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. Part two, English is like a river. <laughs> she did say that. This is her illustration. Very beautiful. Listen, rivers look like one cohesive body of water, but are actually made up of many different currents, sometimes hundreds of them. Alter one current and you alter the whole river. This is the application. Dialect is one type of current to the river of our English language. Each of these currents is doing its own thing and each is an integral part of English. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Because I have a habit of not thinking this way, <laughs> <laughs> of upholding this standard of English in certain settings. I believe a certain type of English should be spoken and written, especially written. I hate to see English written incorrectly. Mm -hmm. But who in the world do I think I am? And depending on the setting, the point is to be understood. Yeah. Mm hmm. No matter what setting you're in, except an ad. Come on, don't don't put bad English on advertisements. Right. Or how about know your audience? Yeah, know your audience, because the point is to be understood and to come off with some level of intelligence, usually. Right. But to your audience. To your audience. So right. if my audience doesn't exist where you're where we speak like that, mm -hmm. then it might be OK to have this. Know your audience and speak for them. Yep. Oh, yeah. You and Corey are blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> now, she does give the anecdote of an English uh, of a social studies teacher she had in school as a youth who told the class to speak correct and proper English. Ooh. None of that dropping the ING. <laughs> he had some other things he didn't like that were particular to the African-American vernacular English. And she went back home with her friend who was black. Her friend said, I don't need no white man telling me how to 
speak no English? <laughs> I already speak it. Her mother hollered from the kitchen. Some white man, Stephanie. You don't need some white man to tell you how to speak proper English. <laughs> so Corey goes home to her mom and she's telling her about her day. And her mom goes, hey, Corey, can you quit talking like these? <laughs> she mimicked. We don't talk like these. I was bewildered, said Corey. <laughs> I'm just talking, I said. And in the heavy silence Ooh. afterwards, she said, you know, your friends probably think you're making fun of them when you talk like that. Whether it was disingenuous or not, it worked. I was suddenly keenly aware that I looked white but sounded black or Chicana and that this reflected somehow poorly on me. I was from that point onward very careful about the types of words that came out of my mouth and how they sounded. I abandoned up talk. Once she refined her language skills to the level that um, was acceptable in her culture, in her culture. she went to college and they thought she was a hick. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you can't win. We all right. speak the way we do, at, to your point, based on where we come from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So whose English is right English? Get out of here. Fun bit. African-American vernacular English. She gives an example that made me chuckle. Um, the way we speak, if someone says, if I tell you that he been sick, what does that mean? If I say Alexis been sick. What does that mean to you? I've been sick for a while. You have been sick. Mm -hmm. But what if I say, Alexa's been sick? I've been sick for a while. Are they the same? No. I, I don't know how you're saying them different, but in the book, I got it. I do. I totally <laughs> so I knew say, what you were saying. say, Alexa's been sick, that means Alexis has been sick. Right. But if I say, Alexis been sick, that means this is nothing new. She's always sick. <laughs> and maybe I'm even annoyed by it. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was fun. It was fun. Mm -hmm. She's got a lot of those in yeah, here. Yeah, she does. It's but a very witty book. It is. I chuckle many times throughout Same. <laughs> but she makes a great point about marginalizing a dialect and how that can have dire consequences. Do you remember the Trayvon Martin case? Absolutely. That's the dumbest question I ever asked you. Absolutely. Um, you may remember that he was on the phone with a friend, Gentel. And when she gave her deposition in court. Testimony. Testimony. Thank you. I knew you'd know. <laughs> it was all on the news because it was um, said that she didn't speak English. No oh, one could yeah. understand her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how old was she? Oh, was she 16? Uh, yeah. I just remember thinking, young. wow, they're speaking this way about a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because some really mean things were said by adults um, pertaining oh, yeah. to this girl. Absolutely. And we know how that case, um, the outcome of that case, Corey makes a note. If someone um, within the jury had spoken her dialect, it may have ended up differently. Mm -hmm. But no one could understand her. So it's even dangerous to uh, other people because of the way they speak. Mm -hmm. yep. That part stuck with me. Another fun bit. Will versus shall. So will in the first person singular and plural promises or threatens. I will come to your house at 5 p.m. <laughs> in the second and third person only foretells. Alexis will come to your house mm -hmm. at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Shall, on the contrary, in first person simply foretells. I shall come to your house at 5 p.m. In the second and third person. Promises, demands, or threatens. Alexis shall come to your house at 5 p.m. Yes. <laughs> That's fun. It is. That's a little fun thing. Yep. Okay. Quote, all words are made up. Do you think we find them fully formed on the ocean floor or mined for them in some remote part of Wales? <laughs> Stop being high and mighty about your language. That part is mine, not hers. <laughs> But that's what I got from her quote, and I just loved it. I love a book written by someone smarter than you yeah. in a way that is, uh, see, told you she was smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> so down to earth. Now, if Corey, who knows language better than anyone I've ever known, met or dreamt about, 
can be so down to earth and forgiving when it comes to the way people use this thing she's loved and dedicated her life to. Who am I to say that people must stop saying pacifically when they don't mean peacefully? (laughs) What? Are you talking about the ocean? But who do I think I am? Let them say pacifically. I know what they mean. Do you? Yes. Yes, I do. Because no one says pacifically in everyday conversation. So if you tell me, pass me the red pen. No, no. Pacifically the red pen. You know what I'm going to do? Pass you the pen and shut up. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm getting off my soapbox. Your high horse. Specifically. No, no one cares. You understood it. And the point Wait, of language is, is to be word? understood. What is the word? Don't do that. You know, I would like to know the word. Specifically. Okay. <laughs> the word is specifically. We can say space, Alexis. We we don't have a problem. No one says pace. That's fine. You know, I had a friend and we had a dog named Twix. Mm-hmm. And the friend could not pronounce the word Twix. Yeah, my dad couldn't say mix. He would say Twix. Okay. (laughs) It was so cute. (laughs) Twix. Twix. Yeah. When he was trying to say Twix. But that's also like me not being able to say WW. Oh, world. Yeah. Well, I am happy to say I can say everywhere that has ever existed. (laughs) (laughs) And we shall move on. I love it. We speak English the way we do because we don't think it's fancy enough to meet our aspirations. Mm. Ooh, another humble bomb. I'm going to call these little things, Corey says, humble bombs. French, Latin. Now those are fancy languages. (laughs) That's how we think. So we don't end a sentence with a preposition because they don't do that in Latin. (laughs) Right. And this is not Latin. (laughs) This isn't Latin, you guys. No. It's all American English. Lingerie, also laundry, because we fancy. (laughs) So, you know, her point is, come down off your high horse. Mm -hmm. No one is speaking English properly. And also English is a bastard language. Quote, no one speaks English natively. Here we go. Say it again. (laughs) Say it again. While everyone thinks they speak standard English, no one natively speaks it. Standard English is itself a dialect based on written ideal that we learn as we gain education. Yep. If we all spoke standard English as a native dialect, then books on good grammar or proper English would be useless. We'd already know it because it'd be our very first dialect. Yep. All the rules about terminal prepositions, the correct use of dilemma and not using snuck <laughs> would be pointless. We would absorb those finer points of usage as easily as we absorb oxygen so yeah (laughs) part three the dictionary ain't a bible and this is the final part um the writers of dictionaries as we said are not authorities in this country now some countries do have their own language authorities Mm -hmm. not here not in the states they are scribes they are merely writing what is already being said in the real world Any linguist knows that the sign of fluency is not how well you write, but how well you speak a language. And I love that Corey really dug into this point because what she is saying is that she loves her job. Yeah. But what is more important in language than a written form of it is the way we speak it. Language is spoken first. It is written afterward. Right. Written language is a byproduct of what is already out there. Um, The Internet gives us all the opportunity to form English. Hey, remember when everything was on fleek? Now, I will say I was on Vine at that time. And when fleek hit me, I was so confused because I love Peaches Monroe. When she said her eyebrows was on fleek. On fleek. I said, what is this? And how can I, too, get my eyebrows on fleek? (laughs) (laughs) And that's how quickly language changes. Isn't that great? I love it. Language is progressive. So in 2013, this book was written, um, Grammar, the Ultimate Introduction to Grammar and the Writing of Good English by a businessman named Gwen. And in it, he says, grammar is the science of using words rightly, leading to thinking rightly, leading to deciding rightly, without which, as both common sense and experience show, happiness is impossible. Therefore, happiness depends at least partly on good grammar. Corey argues this is baloney. For example, It's 
ITS versus IT apostrophe S. Oh. Everyone argues that it's unforgivably yes. easy to keep these straight. I too have argued this point. However, everyone has gotten it wrong at some point. Yep. I too have gotten this wrong. We in company do. meme for sure. That she presents as evidence that it is not that um correct grammar is not a sign of morality. Grammar is simply grammar. The possessive it's in fact IT apostrophe S was a thing since the 17th and 18th century. So again, calm down. English is crazy. Yeah. So speaking of new words, I got to tell you this. <laughs> like I created a word. The word I created was snaying. <sighs> okay. That is snow and rain. So sleep. That's not the same thing. <gasps> so You're guess right. what? Guess what? I went out there and I Googled it. <laughs> And guess what my word popped up? What? It's out there. It's a word. Snane. Snane. It's a word. So it was already in existence. It's not in a dictionary. It's it's probably working on developing strong usage throughout the world. <laughs> well, but create it is an a entry thing. in Urban Dictionary. You'll be. Yes. And give yourself credit. A new word suggestion on Google. Snane. A mix of snow and rain. You know, that's interesting because I know what sleet is, but I rarely see it. But in Chicago... I'm, it's snaining all the time. Thank you, sis. Yes, get it out there. Yes, yeah, snain. Mm -hmm. It be snaining. You know, I'm so glad you shared it. That was really important. <laughs> I'm just saying, when I found out, I said, let me just <laughs> test my word out. Yeah. I've been using it for a really long time. I feel <sighs> passionate about it. And don't you cut my stuff out. No, I won't cut this out. <laughs> I'm going to cut this out. So as we can see, definitions are hard. So aside from moving personal bias, you must find the correct sense of a word. Mm -hmm. Is it an adverb? Is it conjunction? What is this word? Does this word sometimes work as a noun, but also sometimes work as a verb? Mm -hmm. mm. Example sentences must never be more interesting than the definition itself. Damn. So don't try to quote that novel you love where this word is used. <laughs> no, find a more boring use of this mm -hmm. word. Then find the year of origin. Yeah. Dig through piles of citations, old newspaper clippings, physical paper that yeah. still exists in museums. Can you believe that? To look for the first usage of this word and find the country of origin. So you might find a newspaper dating back to the 1700s that uses IT apostrophe S. But from which country did this word come from? Mm -hmm. You also must find that. To decide how most people pronounce it. Not necessarily how it's supposed to be pronounced. Along with this thought, how do you say this word, Alexis? N-U-C-L-E-A-R. You know, I had some feelings about that. Please. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask you the same question. Okay. I asked you first. Nuclear. Oh, it's nuclear all day long. Yeah. So the other word, is it nuclear? Nu it can be a lot of things. People say nuclear. Nuclear. <laughs> but was there was one where it was just two syllables. Is it nuclear? Nuclear. Nuclear. But also nuclear. No, that's three. Nuclear. So yeah, nuclear. I, I say nuclear. Nuclear, nuclear, and nuclear. Dude, so glad you asked about that. So the linguistic process by which nuclear became nuclear, oh, my brain, is called metathesis, which I've been calling metathesis, <laughs> which Corey admitted she's been calling yeah, metathesis, she at which point I felt a lot better about myself. She's a humble. Yeah, she's a humble broad, this Corey. Mm-hmm. Where two phonemes within a word switch positions. Another example of this is iron, which we don't pronounce as iron. Comfortable is comfortable. We learned as children that if words have the same cluster or letters at the end, they rhyme. Hop, pop. Right. Hat, hat. Until they don't. But then we encounter through and though. Rough, cough, and bow. Five words that all end in O-U-G-H. And not only don't they rhyme, but they don't even have similar pronunciations. Not even a little bit. Mm -hmm. Also, one done in shun rhyme. How is that possible? So, yeah. What's nude? In 2015, BuzzFeed put together a panel of black women and had them look at things that were beige. 
<laughs> that were labeled as nude. Things totally like, uh, you know, pantyhose and stuff. Yep. Now, I can relate to this boy. Mm-hmm. Nude ain't thing. never been nude. Nude has always been ashy <laughs> or beige. <laughs> this is true. This is true. One woman on the panel said, that is insane. Now, we're all used to it. This is just what happens when you live in the society. It's assumed that the standard is not you. Right. But Corey worked with her partner to present a new definition. And that definition ended up being having a color such as pale beige or tan that matches the wearer's skin tones, such as new pantyhose or new lipstick. She really poured herself into revising she that did. definition. She did. So in the end, she says this, this career of lexicography is my own little contribution to the world. I love that quote because books are very important. They shape um, how we think and how we live, at least for a lot of people. And the ability to read is really a gift, a privilege and a right. Mm, Thoughtful. Let's take a break. And we're back. Alexis, what did you think of Word by Word, The Secret Life of Dictionaries? Would you recommend it? What's your final verdict? Okay, let me start by saying um, that I felt like it was witty and I enjoyed her. um, I enjoy how she told the story Mm. of it. Um, I learned a lot, particularly about how much time and effort they put into writing the book and made me have a lot of respect for them. Um, She says she spent a month on one word. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was nude or another word, but I know she spent a month on one word. I think it was take. Oh, yeah, take. (laughs) And then some other editor said they spent nine months on a word. Yes. So Mm -hmm. I have a great deal of respect that came out of this. That being said, this book was, for me, highly technical. Mm -hmm. And I can't. If you're not a technical reader, then I don't recommend you read this. Mm-hmm. If if you like to read for fun, this is not the book that you would read. If you like to read for fun, this ain't fun. Mm-mm. <laughs> Mm-mm. Okay. I, I did. There were aspects that I enjoyed, but I felt like it was really hard to read. I don't know why it took me seven days to read this book. I can say for me. Corey's vocabulary is extensive. Yes. And with my Kindle, I did have to um, note many definitions. Many. And it, it made the reading, um, it made the reading harder and longer Mm -hmm. for me. I spent two days on one chapter. (laughs) I think it was taking me two hours (laughs) to read a chapter. I was like, am I ever going to end this? I would get through two pages. Right. (laughs) It was too much for me. Mm Mm-hmm. May I have your thoughts, please? What's your final verdict? My final verdict is um, speaking for myself. Yes, this was a book that was difficult for me because of the vocabulary. However, I believe this book expanded my own vocabulary, my own even grasp and understanding of the English language Um, when it came to the origins of English. And, and how words change throughout centuries. Yeah. And I feel like it really humbled me because it made me rethink the level of credit I give myself for the form of English I speak. Oh, interesting. As a copywriter, I'm not a real writer, you guys. I just write ads. Um, as a <laughs> copywriter. Don't diminish your work, okay? okay. <laughs> and as a lover of English, I would highly recommend this book. Oh, finally. The challenge. Yeah, we finally disagree. (laughs) But not really, because I recommend it to other writers. (laughs) Ah, so that's that technical aspect. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. logophiles. If you're a person who collects words, then you'll love this. (laughs) And this is a book I'd read again. It is not a beach read. It is not a book I can read with a cocktail. I had to read this with water. I couldn't even eat. (laughs) I think we are on the same page. In yeah, the way that so. we're um, recommending it, because it is for me, it was very technical. And mm-hmm. I was like, 
Oh, there's so much to know. If you would ever th- consider reading the dictionary, yeah, read this book. <laughs> <laughs> you can read this instead and benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah. I loved Corey. Mm-hmm. She was great for writing this through. And it wasn't, the words she used weren't um, needlessly long. No. Or difficult. They were words that she used naturally. It naturally. Didn't, it didn't seem like she was writing with a thesaurus next to her. This is just her vocabulary. And I love her for that. Yeah. And it wasn't like she was, it was, she was trying to impress us in her writing. Right. This was just straightforward. Imagine speaking to her. Hello. Ooh, girl. Uh-uh. Stop it. Let us not. A text from Corey Stamper. No, thank you. No. Pass. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> but Corey, we do welcome you to visit us. Okay? <laughs> Stop in anytime. <laughs> you guys, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. It was great. We did it. We made it through another one. Yay. Everybody, thanks for listening to List Society. We'll be back with you next week. List Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. Listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all major podcast providers. If you like what you've heard today, please tell a friend about List Society. Visit listsocietypod.com to sign up for the world's best free newsletter. It's really great. Until next time, read Read something. something.